Uh, the NFL informed clubs today that any team employee who refuses a COVID-19 vaccination without, quote, bona fide medical or religious ground will be barred from what's known as tier one or tier two status. And then they'll have restricted access within the team facility and not work directly with players. But wait, there's more. Earlier today, the NFLPA released a statement on behalf of the Denver Broncos, uh, which reads that playing in the NFL is a dream of our players who work tirelessly year round to perform in America's greatest game. With off-season programs starting in less than a week and without adequate protocols in place in order for us players to return safely, we will be exercising our right to not participate in voluntary off-season workouts. Goes on to say that uh, COVID-19 remains a serious threat to our families and our communities. Positivity rates in our city uh, are higher than they have been at this time last year, than they were at this time last year. And it says, despite having a completely virtual offseason last year, the quality of play across the NFL was better than ever by almost every measure. We hope players across the NFL work with our union as we did to get all of the facts so every player can make an informed decision. Some serious business going on here uh, with these players taking a stand. Uh, and, and the Seahawks joined in for the protection of everyone's safety. The Seahawks said that they're deciding not to, they're deciding to exercise their CBA right to not participate in voluntary in-person workouts. Uh, Charles Robinson from Yahoo Sports is here. Uh, Charles, uh, what has been the response around the league, and and will the Broncos and Seahawks soon have company in uh, in sitting out in person voluntary workouts? Yeah, they will. Um, you know, this is something that when you talk to the union, I've been talking to the union, you know, individuals inside the union for more than a month about this. It's always been sort of headed this way, and and I think there's been advisement on behalf of J.C. Treader, who's the president of the union, DeMora Smith, who's the executive director, that conditions have not changed enough to really warrant them backing away from wanting to have a virtual offseason. It was successful last year, um, and the thought process is it's better just to be as safe as we can possibly be with players while these sets of conditions continue to exist. You look at the state of Michigan, which has, a, a, yet again, has a spiraling COVID situation. You have other states that are on the verge of that again. Um, and so I think the union has said to the players, like, look, you need to come up with a consensus amongst yourselves. Uh, you know, everyone has an NFLPA rep. Uh, whether or not you want to be there for voluntary workouts, we have collectively bargained you not necessarily having to be there. And, and if you decide collectively that you don't want to be, then let's take that stance. And we've seen that a couple of times today. I think we'll see a couple other teams at minimum do that. And um, it's just sort of where we're at. I thought it was interesting today that the NFL definitely took of of the American professional sports leagues, the NFL definitely took the hardest stance on leveraging vaccination. When you tell tier one and tier two employees, mm -hmm. look, we're just not going to let you near players if if you're not going to get vaccinated, yeah. and and you better have either a medical or a religious um, stance to take here to get out of that. That's that's the NFL coming out about as strongly as they can. With remember, um, people will say, well, why don't they mandate players have uh, every player get vaccinated because the, the players working conditions are collectively bargained by a union. The, the tier one and tier two personnel that the NFL is now uh, putting into this corner, they don't have a collectively bargained union stance. Those are league employees. Now they're team employees, but they're also league employees. So they fall under the league offices um, influence at this point. All right, Charles, we know the Broncos the NFL and saying, we, have... We've lost the left money. Hey. Sorry, yeah, okay. I, I would just say, so, as the NFL said, we've lost enough money. Let's go yeah. we'll get vaccinated. So, Charles, Charles, the Broncos and Seahawks have taken their stand. What's the counterpunch from other teams? What is the counterpunch, well, period? Okay, well, okay, so I'll give you an example. Um, the Cowboys have, I, I don't know what the totality of the personnel um, this offseason in terms of being in the building working, but the Cowboys have already had a number of players, I think it exceeds 20 on the roster who have been in the facility on their own doing workouts, you know, getting treatment. Um, and, and I think you'll see Jerry Jones is essentially going to say to the players, it's up to you. If you guys want to be here. Great. You know, come in, be here, um, be part of the program. And it, it's a, it's a fine line that teams have to walk here because of course, coaching staffs, and I would say front offices, everyone wants their players in, and working together um, just like any other offseason. And, and 
I think they'll say, well, look, we've, we've jumped through all these hoops to get to this point of making things safe. Um, why, why now won't you take advantage of that? You know, this is we're, it's not last year where there are all these great unknowns. There are a lot of known knowns now, and, and we know how to attack this and we know how to keep ourselves safe. And oh, by the way, if you want to get vaccinated, great, get vaccinated and there's going to be relaxed protocols. Um, so I think that's the counterpunch. You're just going to have, but I, I don't think it will be very overt. <laughs> it's not, it's, you're not going to hear yeah. a lot of these owners out here banging a drum to, to, basically go against the league and and this idea that the league's like hey everybody get vaccinated and then if you decide you don't want to be a part of the, the voluntary stuff don't be a part of it teams aren't going to go out there and say well forget that forget what we just collectively bargained well and, and beyond the broncos and seahawks just uh housekeeping the nflpa executive director demora smith and jc trotter they sent a separate memo to all players advising them to go ahead and not participate uh, in in-person workouts as well. So, um, all right, Charles, draft. What are the Falcons going to do at four? That's a good question. Obviously, well, that's depending see- on what the Niners do at three. I'm skipping right. the Niners, but if you want to pull them into the conversation, be my guest. Well, they're going to go see Justin Fields. I mean, I think that's interesting. And, um you know, I think that Terry Fontenot and, and Arthur Smith and Arthur Blank all have to get on the same page to decide um, what is the building plan going forward. Because that's really, if they identify, let's say it's Justin Fields or Trey Lance or, you know, Mac Jones, if Mac Jones doesn't end up going to San Francisco at three, if they identify one of these quarterbacks as being worthy of being a cornerstone player. You now have to sit down and have that conversation about, where are we in terms of a build? Because if we keep Matt Ryan here um, and, and we dedicate uh, the 2021 season and, and beyond to Matt Ryan, then this is a micro rebuild. We have to turn this fast. We're looking at Arthur Smith and we're saying, we're looking at you to pull like a Matt LaFleur in Green Bay and instantaneously um, mm. be able to transform us within a year um, into NFC title contenders. If that's not the plan, this is an elongated um, build or at least more than one year uh, and, and you identify your quarterback. I think the most accepted plan nowadays, the new sort of remember when we all started covering the league, there used to be like, Hey, there's a three-year plan. I even remember covering like a team and hearing them say a five-year plan. Once the new quote unquote plan now is if you can get a quarterback, that's your franchise guy, you can get him on the, um, the rookie salary. That's going to allow you to, to swing things in your direction within a couple of years. And if they see Justin Fields and they go, you know what, he's he's worth the number four pick, or Trey Lance, he's worth the number four pick, and he fits with what our coach wants to do, um, then I, I I think that's an organization that will go the Alex Smith route uh, with Patrick Mahomes, and they'll say, you know what, we're gonna we're gonna take a guy, we're gonna take the pressure off him, and give him a year as we sort of sort through what we want this roster to look like, and then in 2022, this will be his franchise moving forward. All right, so. Let's uh, let's let's play along here. Let's say that number three. We know this. The 49ers are taking a quarterback, and whoever is picking at number four. Let's say whoever it is, Atlanta or somebody right. else, picks right. a quarterback. Who is quarterback three? Who's the, who's the, who's the third pick and who's the fourth pick? Just the guys. What guys are we talking about? That's the big mystery. That's the big Kyle Shanahan mystery. That's what I always tell people. Like everyone's you know, putting Mac Jones in there for Kyle Shanahan and 49ers. And I'll admit there's a lot of smoke there and a lot of people that that have ties to the organization truly believe it's Mac Jones. We've discussed this before. I will not rule out Trey Lance or Justin Fields if they believe that is is the right guy. Um, the problem that I have is people that are closer to Kyle than I am um, believe that Mac Jones is the hammerlock pick there. And um, if that's the case, I would be surprised if Trey Lance is not the fourth quarterback off the board, only because when I ask people to stack up how the quarterback situation looks, um, it seems like, and and I can't really explain this because I really like Justin Fields and what he brings to the table, but it seems like Justin Fields is the guy who is slotting as the player who maybe gets to the Patriots, say, at 10, and and gives the Patriots a, a tough decision to make um, if he's sitting there at 10. But um, I would say that the way most teams are stacking it up, if they look at how the draft is likely to fall, and not many have confidence in how the draft is likely to fall, by the way, it's 
Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, um, Mac Jones, Trey Lance, and then Justin Fields are, are potentially five quarterbacks who come off in the top 10. But I swear I'm telling you, teams are mystified as far as how this draft is going to go. I don't think teams have much confidence in feeling like they understand how the picks after five are really going to look. Well, I want to focus in on six. Um, and it's, I think this is the last thing I have for you, but we've said that a million times before and yeah. gone much longer. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I want to focus in on six. So, Charles, you know, I covered the draft for a long time. You covered the draft for a long time. You know, every now and then there's a smoke screen that they're putting out to everybody and everybody right. buys it. And then every right. now and then everybody's hearing the same thing for a reason because there's some truth to it. Today I saw three new mock drafts um, and I heard independently that for all the talk about Jamar Chase, if he gets past the Bengals being the, the receiver that the Dolphins take or even reuniting Tua Tonga Valoa and Devontae Smith, that Kyle mm -hmm. Pitts is the guy for the Dolphins at six. So Jerry Jones could be as infatu infatuated as he wants with <laughs> Kyle Pitts. He's going six at the latest. Uh, and so, but, and I saw the mock drafts, they all had Kyle Pitts six to the Dolphins. I'm like, okay, I'm hearing it. They're hearing it. Either we're all being lied to, or that's the guy that they're zeroing mm -hmm. on at six. So what's your you take know, on, on the <laughs> best player in the draft in my mind to Kyle Pitts? I got a wonderful line for you from a general manager uh, yesterday about mm -hmm. Kyle Pitts. And it was interesting because I think, I wonder if he's talking to some of these other draft people because I've seen this name now come up in some of the evaluations and those sort of spider webs that they do in terms of the measurables. And But I had a, I had a general manager say to me yesterday, DK Metcalf should have reclassified himself as a tight end. <laughs> He said, he, said, he, said, DK, he said DK Metcalf would have been a top five pick if he would have just set up a yeah. tight end instead of saying smart. a whole wide receiver. And but, so but I, and it's and it's interesting because I've seen some of those comparisons now on on you know Twitter amongst the draft Knicks where they're like, you know, hey, his measurables chart looks pretty similar to DK Metcalf's. Um, but DK Metcalf, you know, his, his speed's a little bit better. So that deep speed, down the field mm -hmm. speed is a little bit better. But that that they're very, you know, the build is similar, the strength is similar, they've got length. Um, uh, you know, some of the, the things that maybe you pause on are the three cone times, the 20 yard dash, you know, the things that, the, the sort of explosive things that you expect a wide receiver to have that people really freaked out about DK Metcalf. Well, DK, DK, excuse me, if DK Metcalf had been a tight end, Everyone would have looked at him like Kyle Pitts. This is the greatest tight end we've ever seen athletically. He looks <laughs> right, unbelievable. Right. So I, I agree with you. I don't see, you know, Dallas is sitting there at 10, and I know Jerry's pretty infatuated with Kyle Pitts. Um, but I don't – I would be stunned if Kyle Pitts got to 10. And, and I think that – we talked about this in free agency. I think that the Patriots going out and spending their free agent dollars on a pair of tight ends, it signifies – how they look at the NFL moving forward with guys like George Kittle. If you have mismatched tight ends or Travis Kelsey, that is the that is the huge exposure exposure mismatch right now. And that let to alone me is two of them. Elevate, let alone two of them, right? But Mike I mean, Kisicki, that's what elevates. Mike Kosicki, right? Mike Kosicki right. and Kyle Pitts is a nice tandem in Miami for sure. And they have an offensive coordinator who now I think knows how to use Mike Gusecki. <laughs> I'm not going to bang on Jane Gailey, <laughs> right. but I was never a fan with right. how he used him. But you're right. Yeah, you put those two guys out there. And I think the tandem two tight end looks, that personnel grouping, if, if they can catch and if they can block, um, that's really where the, the new mismatch is uh, for the NFL. And, and so I think that's what starts to value a guy like Kyle Pitts. I, it's, I think teams now... Um, we've definitely entered an era where there's a far more of a concentration about, especially offensively, about not whether guys can fit schemes necessarily or not whether they have certain skill positions. It's what mismatches can we create with these players? And yeah. if they really see a young draftable player who they see a lot of different ways that they can use him in particular to create mismatches, that elevates the draft status of players. And that's why I love the, the kind of DK Metcalf joke about too bad DK didn't mm. reclassify himself. That's a good one. Hey, now listen, this, this, this is, this is my last one. Mike had his last one. This is my last one. <laughs> and I, I think I can get a two for one here because I had this item in my feed. I was going to ask Mike about it. 
but I can ask you both at one time. Oh, and thanks. it is, uh, it revolves around um, Julian Edelman. He retired yesterday. And oh, if you ask most people in New England, <laughs> you ask people, most people in New England, is Julian Edelman a Hall of Famer? Most people in New England will say yes. And I say, I'm too close to it because I keep saying, what? What? Right. No. No. But not too people here say, rational. yes. Look at the look at the postseason. He, 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 you know, he's right behind Jerry Rice in some of these postseason categories. I'm like, yeah, but look right. at the regular season too. All right, I'm too close to it. I can't call it. How about y'all? Is Julian Edelman a Hall of Fame wide receiver? Well, I'll let Mike answer first. Well, you know where I stand. Michael that's an easy. That's, you know where I stand. That's an easy no, and that's okay. It's like the problem with the pro Hall of Fame crowd is that if you say no, then they take it as some kind of a slight or insult, as if. The Hall of Fame is like everybody just gets a right. ticket to Canton. Like he right. had a great career. He was incredible in the postseason. He was a Super Bowl MVP. They made a documentary. His career is a movie. That's enough. He ain't got to go in the Hall of Fame because he's second in postseason receiving stats. It's like Heinz Ward got better stats than he does, and Heinz right. Ward ain't in the Hall of Fame. You know, like and that's just one example. Receiver in particular, Charles, you know this, is su- there's always been such a log jam at receiver. Right. Until there's a, is, how long is that line that he would have to skip to be a Hall well, of Famer? At least in the short term. Down the road, will he, yeah. yeah, down the road, will somebody reconsider maybe a, as a senior uh, selection or something like that? But but no, he's not a Hall never of Famer. Never made That's a okay. Pro Bowl. That doesn't mean he wasn't good. Or an All Pro. Never been an All Pro. Never made a Pro Bowl. Yeah. He, you know, I, you I think he's a really good player, and I think the the. Patriots are going to run into this as far as that 20 year dynasty. And I'll take it back to conversations I've had with a multitude of Hall of Fame voters who have been doing it for a really long time or who did it for decades. And what they would always tell me is go back and look at the Don Shula era of the Miami Dolphins, including that undefeated team in 72. Number of really good players from those Dolphins teams that didn't make it into the Hall of Fame. And, and, you know, there's, there's just a reality that you, um, and I'm not a Hall of Fame voter here, but there is a reality that there's a certain standard that I think um, players have to meet. And I don't think any one given thing punches your ticket. I don't think just because, you know, he was a great postseason player. He really was. I mean, I love Julian Edelman in the postseason. And, and you know, the, the Rams Super Bowl alone, you know, we watched uh, the Rams throw everything at Julian Edelman trying to stop him, and, and they couldn't. And, that's great, but um, the, look, the Hall of Fame comes down to a resume. It does. It comes, and there are a lot of different things that play into that. Not just the postseason, not just the regular season. Um, if if To and and I look, I will say this about about Terrell Owens. Um, I think he has a legitimate gripe when he complains about being held out because people thought he wasn't a good teammate. But I do think there was a reality there. There was a certain um, bias internally there for some people about you know what they heard about uh, Terrell Owens being a teammate in the locker room. So it's, this is part of the debate of the hall of fame is that, you know, you, you, what defines a resume can change amongst those 48 different voters, but I'm with you guys. I think the totality of the resume, well, impressive makes Julian Edelman a Patriots hall of famer. I think if you're looking at a team and go. saying, this is one of the greatest uh, Patriots of all time, it's the same as with the dolphins. They have a number of, of dolphins who are considered, you know, um, defining players in that team's history, but who are not Hall of Famers. I think, you know what I think we should do? You know what I think we should do? I think we should actually put our money together and we should find a city, uh, you know, obviously Canton's taken, and we should construct a Hall of Very Good. Like, we should actually (laughs) physically construct a Hall of Very Good. Have a committee and everything. And you cannot pick people who are in the Hall of Fame. Let's just actually build that hypothetical Hall of Fame, very good that we always talk about, that people like Eli Manning and, and, and Julian Edelman belong in. Actually, bonus question. Is he actually done? And I'm not trying to put any stock in, 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 mm-hmm. in Rob Gronkowski, because I know what he was trying to do with his quote. Right. He was just being Gronk. <laughs> but right. is he yeah. actually done, or could he be the latest person to jump on the Buccaneers uh, championship ship uh, when he gets healthy? I made the joke when, when you know, he had failed the physical that, you know, what's the, how many tickets are there to, to Tampa in the next 26 minutes or whatever I tweeted. Um, <laughs> I think if you listen, look, I, by all accounts, people who know him 
say he's done. That the, that the knee was bad enough last year that he felt like it was something that was not improving and it, and it was going to you know, put him in a position in his career where he was never going to get back to being what he was. And, and that, you know, he didn't like that. He didn't, he didn't want that. And um, now that said, I don't, I don't want to be naive at all to what I have seen over the course of my career, which is when players leave the game of football, particularly for some players, you only need to be out a brief period of time and start to get the itch when you're like, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can, you know, I've mm -hmm. never put it past the player coming back ever. And I don't care what they say about their body. I mean, there was a time where Robert Gronkowski was right. crying about the state of his health. And as right. soon as yeah. Tom comes back right. to the league, <laughs> everything's fine again. Right. So um, I'm sure Tampa Bay and the negotiations. Ready to be like, they, give us 20 snaps. I, well, listen, I'm sure Tampa Bay and the negotiations with Antonio Brown probably like, well, you know, <laughs> there's this extra option now <laughs> out there on the table maybe that we didn't yeah. have before. So um, yeah. we'll see. I, how about How about – if, if after picking up Giovanni Bernard, who, by the way, I think is going to be the, the James White slash Dion Lewis for Tom Brady in, in Tampa Bay, yep. plus keeping 22 starters. Yep. Uh, crazy. If they get either Antonio Brown back or, or if somehow Jules decides he, he's going to give it one more go and has the Patriots blessing, um, which I guess he doesn't necessarily need the blessing now. He failed the physical and they cut him. But um yeah. That team is just ridiculous. The rest of the NFC is like burning. <laughs> the Tampa it, ain't even, it ain't even got to the draft yet. It ain't even drafted yet. It, it's, like, a, it's crazy. It's, it's, insane. I, it's insane. And I had real quick, this will be my last thing. I had, a, I was having a conversation with someone, um, a, 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 another, it was an NFC scout. And we were talking about um, them adding Bernard. And, you know, I said, I, I was just going on and on about, you know, well, it's not, you know, it's not fate to complete. Like, you know, there are other teams. I, I kept saying what about the Rams and I, I don't know why, but it did not hit me in this, you know, he said, look, man, they just lost a, a great safety who probably would have been tagged. if He wouldn't have been hurt last year. They lost a corner and they lost their defensive coordinator who was probably the, one of the best coordinators of football last year. And they switched, switched out their quarterback. Why do you think the Rams, you know, we just kind of went down the list and it's, yeah. I, ugh, man, Brady. Uh, what a, yeah. that guy's, what a blessing. Bless. I'm <laughs> telling you, he's going to threaten 10. Sounds crazy, but he's going to threaten oh, 10. Oh, man. He goes before it's all said and done. I'm telling you. Jeez, telling you. Yeah, look, who would have thought he'd get to seven? At, watch. I, hey, it's, it's, watch. Uh, it's pretty ridiculous. It really is. Poor, poor Aaron Rodgers. No wonder he wants to be on Jeopardy. <laughs> hey, thanks for watching Brother from Another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Peacock. Appreciate you.